Hello everybody, just a few words about who I am. I, I'm a producer from Denmark, small language area, 5.8 million people speak Danish, so um, a very different situation from being a UK producer. Um, I, have, I started out in feature films, fiction feature films, and I moved on to being, coming, uh, spe specialized in creative documentaries. I still do fiction, but I do much more creative documentaries. And then I've been a group leader with the Arve since 1992, so for ages, and I'm now presently a head of studies there. So I have done, a, I, I haven't got an exact count, but somewhere between 60 and 70 films uh, as main producer or co-producer, and in my own company called Magic Hour Films. And then I have, through uh, Yave and other workshops that I've done, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of co-production structures. So uh, I have a bit of a perspective. What I don't do, just to be, make it clear, I don't keep all the rules and regulations in my head because my head, my head tends to get overcrowded and they change all the time. So it's also you know, a safeguard to not start doing a co-production thinking I know how it works in that country without checking because you always need to check. It always changes. So I'm not going to tell you exact rules and regulations. I'm going to give you a different kind of strategic approach and some insights, hopefully. Um, and like uh, Agnieszka said, you can ask me questions at any time. Please interrupt. Um, absolutely a good idea. The way I'm going to structure this is that I'm going to first give you a little bit of definitions and sort of set up what, what are the rules, what is the landscape, and then I'll go into more um, the whys of co-production, some motivations from different players in the field, because I think it's important to understand uh, who's out there, what are their interests before you approach them. And, and then I'll uh, go into some how co-production, how do you do it, what is there to think about. And, and in the end, I'll, I'll, if we have time, I'll do two sort of mini case studies where we apply some of the, some of the things that I have uh, talked about to, to real projects, and see how that played out. And um, the bad news is that I, I won't be able to teach you everything about co-production in, in two hours, but as I heard, you also have some experience, uh, some of you, but, but my goal actually is to uh, remind you of the things that you know that you don't know that you have to check, that you have to find out before you em embark on it, but also perhaps to get you to be aware of a few things that you didn't know you didn't know, because those are the real <laughs> pitfalls, uh, because it, it's, it's fine not to know everything. I mean, nobody knows everything. If, as long as you can ask and find out and inquire, that's not a problem. But if you don't know that you don't know, that's when you get into trouble. So hopefully we can sh shed some lights on a few things that you might not know in advance. To start with, this is a kind of a definition uh, of co-production. The whole idea that it's companies from different countries working together. So let's, let's start, and there's a lot, co-production is not a protected term. So even if we give it a definition here so that we agree on what we're talking about, you will meet completely other approaches. So Let's talk with, start with what it's not. I mean, if you go, uh, you, if you have a film and you need to shoot in Romania, and you go to Romania, you find a production company there that takes care of the whole shoot for you, and you pay them to do it, and go home with your film afterwards, that's not co-production. That's a production service. There are no right shares. There's probably no revenue share. Sometimes you can give a company a bonus, which is revenue-based for you know bringing you home on time and on budget and all of these things, so that's an in incentive. It's still not a co-production necessarily. It's not that. Um, what a co-production is normally is um, actually you do co-produce. You share the entire uh, creative, you share the practical uh, part of production. And more importantly, you share rights and revenues afterwards. Copyright, and definitely rights and copyright and revenues. If you, uh, if you have funding from different countries, like the BFI or um, other film institutes, that 
and you produce under uh, the regulations of either bilateral, bilateral co-production treaties or something like the European Co-Production Convention, that makes it an official co-production. An unofficial co-production can be that you, you can sometimes you can still access public funding, but what you don't get with an unofficial co-production is you don't get the nationality, you don't get the registration as a official production of that country, whatever that country is. Um, and but as we will see much later, you can sometimes have an official co-production between, let's say, three parties, and you can have, can have underlying smaller co-productions that are unofficial attached to the official production. I'll, I'll show you that later. But So it gets relatively complicated. Um, normally, you still share rights and revenues, but it's negotiable in this instance. Uh, the, especially the right parts for the unofficial, but it's, it's natural to do it. I, I think it would be hard to negotiate with a co-producer and say you won't get any rights, but it's not set in stone. And where it gets really blurry is when we start talking about co-financing, because co-financing normally only involves sh uh, sharing money or bringing money to a project and not being creatively involved. Uh, but, for instance, television stations, they tend to call co-financing, co-production very often in their, in their setting. They, they, let's say that they only bring a pre-sale in, in reality. They only bring the money that's uh, worth uh, whatever the worth of the license fee would be to screen the film, nothing else, and they don't retain revenues. They may still call it a co-production, but it would be, in a sense, a co-financing deal because they don't have rights and revenues. Um, co-financing is normally reserved for either not having share of revenues, that would be like the pre-sale, or having only share of revenues, not rights. But it, the whole, that line between co-production and co-financing is blurred. It's not a strict line, so you have to remember that. It's not, you know, you can meet very different interpretations of the terms out there. What you have to worry about is the term that your funders and the funders of your co-producers use how they view it. So you have to look at their rules to see how do they interpret it. What does it take for them to acknowledge it as a, for instance, official co-production? Okay. So, official co-production, very clearly, they must follow co-production treaties between countries or the European Co-production Convention. They, that you cannot be an official co-production and not follow the treaties. That's, uh, I just wanted to put it out there like that, even though it's very simple. Bilateral co-production treaties are agreements made between mm -hmm. two countries, and they will lay down some conditions that you have to follow to benefit from being uh, registered as a film in that particular country. And there, there are very many different types of bilateral treaties. They have different rules, so I won't go into that because you really have to look into it. It, it doesn't make sense for me to say there's this and that and the other, because it has to be the relevant treaty for you. So also <coughs> that's also very quickly. I'm just putting it in here also because you get the slides afterwards, so you can remember that this is what I have to go and, and look at. Just ask very briefly, yes. if you were co-producing with a country with which there is no treaty, then it yes. will, of course, be an unofficial co-production. Or follow the European Co-Production Convention, for instance. It, it can be easier if for you. a country outside of Europe, though. Yes, but, but you can choose to follow that. I mean, it, it's a choice also uh, that you may have because it can make certain things easier, you know, to say that, okay, this is, you don't have to negotiate everything, some things are already in place. Um, but of course, that's then negotiation thing. <coughs> but if there is no treaty, it's uh, free negotiation, if according I'm to the rules of the... Underneath the European Co-Production Treaty, my understanding is you can add a non-European country yes. as well. Yes, yes, and yes. Still be the yes. Absolutely. Yes, if you already, for instance, if you, if you already have a, a European co-production and you want to add a non-European partner, you can absolutely do that. 
that that is not a problem at all. These are, to the best of my knowledge, the, the bilateral treaties uh, that are in existence, and there may be more, but uh, these are at least in existence. <laughs> so, could be more. And as you can see, UK has, um, has um, apart from France, they have basically done bilateral treaties with countries with some English language. Uh, They've done that with the colonies, basically. Is, is there what? Yeah, the colony, yes. But also language. There, there is this thing about language, and I'm, f for me, coming from a very small language area, this is one of the big cultural differences mm -hmm. that uh, this country speaks uh, the mother tongue of film, at least if you don't come from India where they actually make more films, but from a Western perspective, English is the mother tongue of film. And this has, uh, I've done co-productions, I think, with at least 25 different countries. I've never done one with the UK. I've done with Ireland, but not with the UK. And it has very often been a language barrier because even though some of the films I've done have actually been in English, it has been broken English. If you do a documentary, for instance, you go and, and interview somebody in English because that's the only common language, but it doesn't sound right <laughs> to English ears. And it has actually been um, uh, a hindrance, I would say. I think this is changing. Uh, it's, a, it's changing a little bit. There is a shift. Uh, I think the shift is due to a lot of different things. It's due to the fact that all our countries are becoming more and more diverse in terms of um, people and languages. It's also to do with uh, the fact that there has now been co-production for so many years and, and the, a lot of the art films that are distributed are not English language, uh, so people are getting used. And, and I think the platforms also has something to, uh, to do with this because they actually now start to show and air uh, projects that are not ling English language. So I think it's slowly, slowly changing, but it has been an issue. Also, there has been an issue between the, the dubbing countries and the non-dubbing countries. Coming from Scandinavia, we do not watch dub films. It, it, it doesn't happen. It's all subtitles. I mean, dubbed is hopeless for us. And, and, uh, and sometimes people have, and I actually wanted to to say that sometimes in the beginning, because it was also inspired by some of the things that were said here, there is such a thing as a natural co-production, which means that you, you s the needs of the film require that you go and shoot in Portugal, for instance, or that you have. Uh, and, and a lot of the time, that's how you start building your co-production. But there's absolutely no rule that a co-production have to be multi-language or that you have to have actors from every country. It's not the rule. And um, there was a lot of learning by doing mistakes in the very early days of co-production where you ended up with what they call Euro pudding, where you act an actor from every country and the film lacks credibility, authenticity, it lacks a home. Um, so Euro, Euro pudding is not the answer to co-production. There, there's a term that I want you to remember is glocal, because very often films that have a strong local identity can become glocal if they are accessible to a global audience. Um, so glocal is a good term in co-production. Don't try to, don't try to fix the film to fit, you know, what you think is every market in the world because you may not actually know what that means. And you can also completely lose a home for the film. So that, that was opinion. That's not deficient. That was opinion. <laughs> um, so let's move on here. Yes, thank you. So just to stay with the, with the definitions a little bit, a multilateral co-production is um, one that has th three parties or more. And the third party co-producer, the term third party co-producer is somebody who is established within the treaty area. But you can also, uh, in a, in a co-production treaty, uh, <coughs> even in a production set up under the co-production treaty, you can have somebody who is not recognized as that, and that would then be called a non-party co-producer. 
uh, that is, for instance, the underlying parties. I will not go into, this is legal detail, I'm not a legal expert, I just want you to know the terms are out there and it may be something that you have to deal with. So you have to check the limitations because, for instance, just to mention one example, um, URI Marsh, they allow you to have uh, co-producers that are not recognized within the European Co-Production Convention, but only up to 30% of the uh, financing can come from such a producer. So you, there are normally regulations linked to this, so please be aware of it. And then I will show you um, here some co-production, European co-production convention structures, and please be aware that they are very much working on ratifying a new co-production convention. Uh, I think they're up to 20 countries now or something like that, so it's going forward, but it takes time, sorry. Um, and so this, these percentage rules are about to change, but these are the ones that are at the moment in effect and were in effect when we, if, if we make it to the case studies, when we get to the case studies. So, uh, in, as it is now, the majority producer cannot have more than 80% of the financing. And I, I say financing because uh, very often people look at the budget. It's not determined by where you spend the money necessarily, it's determined by where the money comes from. So you can go and spend 30% of your money in Hungary, but if you can only raise 10% of the budget out of Hungary, uh, the finance out of Hungary, that is what counts, not the spent, but the, but the financing. There is an exception for very high budget films, uh, because there are very few countries in Europe that can bring very uh, big amounts of money. And uh, the minority, pro in a bilateral minority producer then has to have a minimum of 20%. Uh, in trilateral co-productions, the minority producer cannot have more than 70%, and none of the minority producers can have less than 10%. And this sounds easy. It's not so easy when you start dealing with low capacity countries or low cost countries, because uh, you may choose to go and shoot in Hungary because it's a lot cheaper, for instance, if you can. If it makes sense for your film, you can go to Hungary and shoot. And you can do the entire shoot in Hungary, and you may be able to cover the cost of the entire shoot in Hungary. And of course, we know the shoot is actually worth much, normally uh, worth much more than 10% of the film. It may not be the case if you go and shoot in a low capacity or low, low cost country. So you can sometimes have big issues with co-producing with countries where, where the cost uh, costs and, and uh, financing capacities are much different from your own country. When you say low capacity, you mean yeah. low capacity to bring your own finance? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I think it's still the term in media, low capacity countries. That's where it comes from. It, I don't like the term, but because they are very skillful, very, a lot of the times, very creative. So, uh, <coughs> but, but that is the term in the media. And, and this is actually one of the things they are changing now. They are changing because there's a lot of creative energy in the Balkans, there's a lot of cre creative energy in the former East Europe. Uh, so, and, and this has been a kind of a obstacle to make real co-production. So that's one of the things that changes, that the 10% rule I think will go to five, is that correct? That's what they're trying, 5%, yeah. So exactly to make co-productions easier because otherwise you'll be stumbling over your own feet to try to make it work with different strange, strange measurements that I will actually show you a few things like that later, <laughs> what you can do to make it work. Um, and then the tax incentives are not part of the co-production convention structure, but I put it on here anyway. So normally uh, the tax incentives work as percentage of spend and it's only certain costs that count. So you get something back after you spend, go spend some money, you get it back, you get a refund back at later. So it's very important for you to understand w which costs actually do give you a refund, because otherwise you get it at the very end. So if you didn't get it right, you will be short of money 
at the point where you can no longer save it on something else because it's after the film is done. And it's also, of course, a cash flow thing. <laughs> um, so, um, so that's just something to know. So this is just setting the map. Just, I'm just trying to paint with a big brush here. So, um, so now we're going to move into the Y co-production. If you walk up to somebody in the street and say, me, say give me your money, the likely response is, hell no, or who the fuck do you think you are, or something to that effect. Right? Quite often, that's what we do in code production. We look at our budget and we say, mm, I'm missing some money. I have to find money. So you go up to somebody and say, this is my wonderful picture. Give me your money. It's not so effective, to be honest, because people tend to th think exactly that. Who do you think you are? So what I want you to understand and why I'm doing this is I want you to understand where the, the players in the field come from so that you can talk to them on their turf so, or on their terms, so to speak. So <coughs> the political perspective was why, why did they put, it's, it's about it is probably 30 years ago where there was really, really a shift in political focus towards getting Europe to do more co-productions. And a lot of the media program, for instance, was set up because we had now the EU and we wanted Europe to feel as one, one culture, one market. So it was a political idea, okay, let's start co-producing because they, they know that culture is one of the bridge, uh, cultural exchange is one of the bridge building um, metho methods. So the political perspective was to forge new alliances, make people get to know each other, work together, see each other's films, understand each other's cultures. That was their idea. Uh, of course, there was also the vision of one market that we were all gonna make money. That part, has been probably more slow than they had hoped for because uh, still there are just a handful of films being distributed around Europe. It's not, it's not, it's definitely not every film that's made. Um, it means more than a handful. I'm absolutely exaggerating, but it's not as many as they would want and, and they tend still to be in the art house category. But the art house has actually become quite big over the last couple of years, uh, a lot, uh, there's a shift in a lot of the distributors or sales agents, they, they specifically look for art house, not so much, I mean, depending on who they are, but there, there is an interest in, especially the category that you could say was mainstream art house, that's, that's uh, rising. So, and then they also wanted to strengthen the European culture uh, and the national, on the national level, the political perspective is exactly that, strengthen our own culture. Even though there's a European perspective that says, let's all be European, there's a national perspective that's, that's say, let's strengthen our own culture, uh, our own language, our own industry, our own competitiveness. So there's, there's these two um, political perspectives at the same time, and especially from small language areas uh, like Denmark, for instance, they right now, or no, right now we had an election, but a short while ago we had a very right-wing government and they were actually go the, the nation, most nationalistic party, which wasn't part of the government, but who actually had the vote to, to, they had all the power because if they didn't vote with the government, they were not in majority, so they could they get a lot of things done. So what they tried to get into the film law was that every Danish film that received support had to be Danish language. Uh, luckily, uh, it didn't happen. We had a big, big fight. But it just tells you the perspective is like that. We want to, them to speak Danish, it wants to be. And, and of course, there's a lot of nationalism all over Europe right now. So, so it's, it's something that, um, that's out there. <coughs> anyway, um, the subsidy system, the, the motivation for the subsidy system, the film funds, the regional funds, etc., is 
to prolong their own funds. I mean, they, they first and foremost want to, to fund their own filmmakers and they want to, to make sure that there is more money available for their own films. Of course, they also have co-production systems. So it's not that they are uninterested in co-production, not at all. Uh, and they also want to support minority co-productions, but they want to sort of get their own filmmakers, their own producers, uh, more work. That's sort of the, the one of the primary goals of most funders. They also want to strengthen their own industry. They want to, uh, one of the reasons I'm, not, I'm now guessing, I don't know if this is true, but for instance, a, a course like this is also to, to, to um, empower you to be more confident going out doing co-production and, and learning from it. So it's strengthening your, the, your home industry to do something like this, both creatively and also financially. Then there's also a strategic thing from most funders. Most of them have to answer to a political, the, polit the political masters. They have to prove their worth every so often to whatever government is in place. So they also like to have something to show off. It can be that they were part of one of the really big uh, award-winning films, one that was very successful, maybe it got an Oscar nomination, something like that. So something to show. It can also be uh, that they have co-produced with so many countries, for instance, that they've made the, all this happen or that they attracted so and so many productions to Denmark. But things that are important to for the film funds to show the politicians. I'm bringing this up because producers never think about that when they approach a film fund. They try to you know, look at the rules and think, how can I fit, how can I get the money? But things like this can very, very well be part of your argument for sell selling your project to the film funds. This is something that's important to them. If, you, if there is a, 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 a likelihood that you will win awards, or if there's a likelihood that this will really be noticed because it's the first co-production between XX and YY, uh, that's also something that you can mention, you can add to your, um, to your sale. Uh, then there is um, also the boost of local turnover is very important, especially to re regional funds. Most regional funds, um, again, I'm being, this is a really broad um, brush that I'm painting with here. Most regional funds did not come out of a cultural or film uh, incentive. They came because they were from regions that lost people, businesses, uh, finances. So they set up a regional fund in to try to attract uh, people to come and stay in their hotels and eat their restaurants and uh, do, do local businesses. So they are much more interested in the turnover than they are. You can argue from here until next week about the fact that it's going to win an award in XX fi Film Festival in Zimbabwe and they don't care. They want turnover in the local area. So this is something to have in mind for that. <coughs> and then they also, in, in many countries, uh, the, the subsidy system wants to bridge the gap between cost and financing possibilities. They get projects that they love, and they say, well, this is a great project, we really want this to happen, but unfortunately, we can only give you 30% of what is needed, so where does the rest come from? So that's where they also become interested in co-production. Um, the interest in co-production as a minority from the film funds is uh, both in, for instance, the political, the, the prestige, the awards, the new, new um, forging new corporations, or building very long-lasting strategic corporations. Some of the film funds, for instance, they are very focused, like the Danish, on the fact that you don't co-produce with somebody once, that you actually do it quite often. It, it, it's one of many points that they look at when they evaluate a minority co-production application is, have you worked together before? Have the producers worked together before? Is this a long-lasting relationship? Are we building something for the future here? Or are you just jumping around? That's something they look at, but it's just one of many things. So from the filmmaker's perspective, it's very often just, I want to make my film the best it can be. I want to follow my vision. I want to have everything 
that that is you, you and I understand that and I sympathize with that actually you you don't want to be bothered with all this strategy but you have to look at it as a vehicle to get to the point where you can make your film the best you want it to the best it can be so it's not uh, it's not wrong to have that perspective not at all I think it's one of the big issues and important things to remember to hold on to the vision of the film when you do co-production because you can so easily get uh, lost in all the strategic uh, building build structure building and financing and all of that and you know, start selling out this that and the other to get the finance together in the end you don't have have the vision together anymore so that's one of the things to to um, really hold on to throughout the process so but I, I just want you to take away from here that there is not one that's not you you are not going to sell the film in one way it's different according to who you are talking to and it's different things that you want to hi highlight and think about first of all think about because when you s when you're building your strategy you have to think who could be not not who what do I want but who could I who do I have something of interest uh, to offer to that was not a sense but you got the point right mm -hmm. yeah thank you <laughs> <laughs> so let's look for a second into the producers co-producers motivations because I also I, I one of you asked about that the main producer of a film they are really focused on getting the film made. They are very often the initiator. They, they are really into that film, that film. They want it made. So uh, they, are, they are looking for, uh, you know, to, to enhance the artistic vision and, and, um, and the co corporations possible. They're looking into production needs. Do I need to shoot in another country? Do I need archives that I can best get in France? Uh, what, what is the needs of this? This is really where you come from. And then you want to finance the film so that it becomes possible. And you want to finance it at the lowest cost possible. And when I say lowest cost, I don't just mean money. That's one factor, but I also mean uh, lowest costs in terms of compromise if there is compromise to be made and very often there is compromise to be made uh, so so you really try to build your strategy based on that that's your idea then you probably want access to other markets which is something that co-production will give you because uh, not every country but most countries uh, request that there is a distribution deal in place before they will fund you so you have to ensure, and for instance, your image, they also require that there are distribution deals, theatrical distribution deals in place in all the countries that are official co-producers. Um, so, so it will give you access. In, when, when it's creative documentary, you can sometimes uh, get away with uh, having uh, it aired at a major festival instead. The, problem of course is that you have to prove it at the point of, of uh, application <coughs> and you don't really know that it's going to get selected at the point of, of uh, application. So very often we doc create a documentary, the case is that you, you work to get a distribution deal in place and then if the distributor, when once the film is finished, feels that maybe it's too expensive to, put it, to air it theatrically, you you try to go for a major festival or you do uh, select event screenings, which is also okay. So then you maybe screen in 10 theaters or five theaters or something like that, but you have to have it. Um, <coughs> and then you are looking to create strategic partnerships so that you, you don't, because there, there is a learning curve, not just doing co-production, but also getting to know other people you know, when you start working together, very often it's easier the second time than the first time because a lot of the misunderstandings may have been been dealt with. I, I'll give you an example of, of uh, there, there are cultural misunderstandings that are very likely to occur when you do co-production. I, I did um, my very first co-production 
was a Polish, French, Danish co-production before the wall came down, so I don't think it had ever been done before. And there were so many misunderstandings, cultural misunderstandings. For instance, they brought the Polish crew to Denmark to shoot in Denmark. And I didn't know at that point that the DOP that came, for instance, he, he didn't want to touch the camera. In Denmark, the crews were like 20 people normally on a feature film. In Poland, they were 100. So, I mean, he was like, I'm not touching the camera. I was like, well, then who will touch the camera we're supposed to shoot, right? <laughs> so we had lots of uh, interesting misunderstandings like that, simply because the things that you can't imagine uh, you don't ask about them. You think when they bring the DOP it's because they want to shoot, right? So it, it's just, um, so I was out there rolling cables also because the, the gaffer didn't touch lamps. So, you know, it's like, so we had a lot of fun there. Uh, and we, so, um, but, but things like that, that are many, many things. And also when I did a co-production in Poland later and had to deal with a crew of 100, I remember the, the Polish producer said to me, the first thing he said to me on the first day of the set, he said, and now you have to fire somebody to create respect. I was like, fire somebody? I don't, I don't know anybody yet. Why would I fire somebody? You know, like, hey, you have to do that. And I was like, no way. I'm not going to arrive and fire somebody like, her. And like Trump. You know, you're fine. No, not my style. I also had uh, similar experiences in Norway, which is in, the, in fact, you know, so close to Denmark that most people think of Scandinavia as one, but in Norway, um, they, they are much more strict on time, for instance. So it was really like, you know, in Denmark it's like, okay, we're shooting, we're going to be finished in ten, 20 minutes and everything will be fine. And the first day of the shoot, the production manager came, we had like one shot left, it was a huge period film where it was like a big setup. And the production manager came and said, well, thanks for today, go home. Everyone's like, oh, we were in the middle of the last shoot. He said, oh, it's, you have to go now. I was like, whoa. <laughs> so, I mean, there are cultural differences and, and uh, you don't always have the, the fantasy, the imagination to ask the right questions, but, but you learn over time. So the thing is that strategic partnerships can be good. Um, the minority co-producer, they are, of course, I mean, of course you want to find somebody who loves your project and like the film and are enthusiastic about it. So I'm not saying that this is not the case. Please bear that in mind. Of course you want somebody who really likes the film. But as a minority co-producer, you are likely to look a little bit more at the opportunity of the project than on the film itself. It's not like life and death issue for you whether this film gets made or not necessarily. It's really like, okay, this is a good project. It's a nice cooperation. I like the project, I like the people. It's also a faster result. Very often you're in development for many years and the co-producer can come on board during development, but quite often they come on board in late development or at the time of, of uh, financing, which means that the, the road from uh, starting the project in their company till the result is there is much shorter than if you are the majority co-producer. So it's an opportunity. And, and if, you are, if you are looking at it from a strategic company planning point of view, co-productions can also be very interesting for that reason, because you don't always know how long it's going to take to develop a project. And most of the time it takes longer than you knew and what you planned. And if you knew how long it was going to take, you might never have started it, but then you are already far gone, so you will continue. So what I'm saying is that it can be a way to help you uh, buy some time for your longer running projects. It can be a way of creating turnover in your company, covering your overheads, because there are shorter, there's a shorter while from project start to project end for the minority co-producer. Not always, but often. And um, it, it's also less work intensive. I'm not saying there's no work, there's a lot of work, but it's less work intensive than being the main producer. It's very often quite uh, uh, well defined what your role is, what it is you have to do. Very often it's also uh, in terms of time, it's a limited time. For instance, you 
do part of the shoot or you do part of the post production. So you're the intensity beyond making all the deals and getting the deal in place. The work is very often uh, the the intensive part of the workload is very often within let's say a maximum of six months or something like that. So it makes it easier to, to um, yes? Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Is, is it ever the case that that is reflected in the production fee split? As for example, if the, if, the, if the main producer is doing most of the work and the minority producers bring in 20% of the budget, if they take the 10% fee on the 20% of the budget but they're doing 3% of the work, like it feels like there's a mismatch? Uh, yes, um, I'm going to be talking about mismatches in general okay. later, but, but of course this, this is one of them. This is one of them, who, who is really driving the thing. It, you ca you, exactly with the overhead or the fee, you run into very often to regulations that there is a regulation that this is the kind of overhead and this is one of the really complicated things of, of uh, co-production very often because the, the regulations don't match. Um, in, in Germany I think still you don't have uh, the right to a producer's fee I think is still the case. I'm not sure it might have changed but in, in the beginning in Denmark you were not allowed to have a producer's fee in a documentary, you were only allowed to have a producer's fee in feature films and and you know it, it, it's ridiculous, right? So, but the rules are there until they change. So, you, you're as you, if you intend to be in the business long enough, you will also need to be part of changing them, and and so, and you can do that. But very often, with exactly that, you 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 don't necessarily have the fee on the finance. You very often have the fee on the budget. So, if you if you are spending so and so much money in that country you will have a producer's production fee on the budget and, and on the spend and that is more uh, it is more fair if not completely fair it's more fair because there is a some kind of course again the problem ar uh, arises when we go to very low cost countries cuz like i said uh, i i was not, I'm, i don't know why i keep mentioning examples from poland but Never mind, this is another example from Poland. I was trying to do a co-production with Poland that didn't happen. And the reason why it didn't happen was that um, I was raising money in Norway, and Norway is a very high-cost country, probably one of the most high-cost countries in Europe. And um, I had raised all the money to do the entire sound post-production in Norway. So the whole thing was covered. There was no cost for the Polish majority producer for doing that. But the cost of the sound post-production in Norway was the same as the entire shoot and edit in Poland. So, and, <laughs> and, uh, but this becomes then very difficult because here you have a clear uh, you know, mismatch between the workload and the money. There's a clear mismatch here, right? And I was trying to make the argument it doesn't matter because you need money to finish, you need sound post-production to finish a film and it's fully covered. So as long as we don't give the Norwegian co-producer rights, I mean they can't have 50% of the rights in the film because they only did the sound post-production. If we have that negotiation it's not a problem. But at the end it was just too, you know, too glaring a mismatch so that it, it fell apart at the, at the very end. But these are one of the things that are definitely there to be talked about. So uh, for, the for the minority co-producer, it can also be track record. I mean, if you are looking to, let's say that your next production, uh, you, you plan to apply to media, for instance. It's, it's a good thing for you to have had done more co-production. It, it, it is a requirement that you have done so on, right? So to do minority co-production can also be that. And especially, it can also be, there, there are, some countries, but not very many, have reciprocity, reciprocity rules. Um, but even if there's no rule, there is a kind of a sentiment, let's put it, that there should be some reciprocity. Where we, we don't want to send all our money to this country. We also want something back, kind of. So you can be strategic about what kind of co-production you, you choose because you have plans for the future. You want to build on something as a minority co-producer. And then of course uh, it adds to your library and, and um, the, you have more revenue sources. Uh, not, 
uh, you know, the, the best part of revenues are the ones that you don't work for. So the long tail of a film, where, you know, where you, it may be very little money that just trickles in, but it's, I mean, every time there's something and you didn't expect it because it's just out there working, it's just so nice. It's like, oh, yay, you know, you can invest in this uh, development or something like that. So, so it's also a way to getting more of those trickles. And, you know, en enough trickles makes for a little stream. <laughs> so so um, that's also a, a <coughs> clear motivation. But the one thing that you also have to understand is that to the minority producer, your if you are the majority co-producer, your project will also always be secondary to their own projects. And the reason why I'm saying this is if there is some kind of emergency happening and you need to go and ask more money, let's say that, or you have to go back to your uh, broadcaster or you have to go to your crew and say, can you work an extra day for free because there's absolutely no more money and this and that happen you're much less likely to do that as a minority co-producer because you want to reserve these emergency si situations for your own projects. Mm -hmm. And if you expect that as a majority co-producer, oh, come on, do this, that, the other, you are likely to not get along as well as before. Um, I had, I had, um, I did a co-production that uh, changed extremely much from the beginning from what we were selling to what we did ended up delivering. And there were very, very many co-producers on the film, so I felt that on the, in the process it was a very limited what I could sort of demand or even, you know, say. I mean, I did say things, but there were so many co-producers that, you know, you, you, all, you understand that they can't listen to everybody. But the film ultimately was not what I had sold to uh, both the Danish films, to Danish uh, television and uh, the Danish foreign aid <coughs> it was really not and none of them ever screened or broadcast the film and this was a huge problem for me uh, because actually for the next two or three years it was very very difficult for me to get any money for co-production at all so and and um, it it taught me something it taught me something about how do, do I want to be part of something where I have absolutely no say, control? I mean, you don't have control, not full control as a minority co-producer, depending on how much you're involved. You have more control, of course. But if you are one of very many, the truth is you don't have a lot of control. So if it's people you don't know that well, or, you know, this, this, this was a documentary, it was shooting in Mongolia, so, I mean, you don't even see anything until it's already shot. And, you know, so it, it's, it's very hard to be on top of it like that. But it taught me some caution. And it's just to say that you, you do have a different... I mean, if this has happened, if I had made a film and I was like... The, the film is not bad. I, I have to say that. The film is not bad. It won tons of award. It's just very, very undanged and not what we said it was going to be. It's very pretentious, and Danes are not pretentious. They are like sort of very sort of down to earth kind of people. So it really wasn't something they wanted to air. So s things like that is also something I, I take into account now. And I'm, I'm very careful when I sell a project that I'm selling what I think it's going to be. So, um, so these are the two differences between, and you can of course be both. You can both be the majority and the minority. So, so understanding the different motivations that play into it will make it easier for you both to be clear in what you want as a co-producer, whether it's majority or minority, uh, but also to understand who you are talking to and what you can expect from them. This is the from the film's perspective, and I always urge you to really look at everything, go back, it's a long process, go back every now and then and look at why are we co-producing this and why is it this way that we are co-producing it, why is this a good match for the film. Always go back and look at it from the film's point of view, that's very important. And the positives of why co-production from the film's point of view is that you can get, you can add perspectives to the story at a early stage 
that will make it more likely that it's accessible to other audiences than your own. That's very often the case that you, you think something is obvious and nobody understands when they cross border. I, again, a Polish example, a, f a film called um, The Escape from Liberty Cinema that was by Wojciech Maciejewski. I, s I watched the premiere in Poland and the, I swear the theater, they were rolling around on the floor with laughter. And I watched the premiere in Copenhagen and nobody laughed at any point at all during the entire film. They didn't get it. <laughs> so, I mean, and I wasn't co-producing it, so I'm just mentioning it. It's just, um, but uh, there was another Danish co-producer. But it's just uh, the thing that if you had, this was about censorship, which of course we don't have in Denmark. So if this film would have been, uh, should have been accessible to a Danish audience or a, a European audience, there would have had to be a little bit of explanation about the, the because everything was subtext. I'm exaggerating, but not so much. The, a little bit uh, that would make me understand what is censorship, how does it work? So things like this, and of course it's tricky because you can put too much explanation in there and then lose the national audience, uh, but, but I'm, it's just as an example that it has to be accessible. The things that you don't understand, this just doesn't work, right? Um, it can be access to talent or cast, it can be a, a DOP you absolutely want to work with or uh, editor, whatever. Access to crew facilities archives, archives particularly when you do documentary, very often the case that you need archives that are for some uh, reason or other in one specific country and archives are expensive. Production assistance in foreign country, new dis distribution opportunities, new markets, all of that. And of course money, uh, money from the co-production territory. Then it can be el eligibility for pan-nationality systems. I put media because there's no room for Creative Europe on the line, sorry. But <laughs> it's called Creative Europe. I mean, when I, s when I say media, it's Creative Europe. Um, because when you have the co-production, like Francesca showed you before, you are so much more likely. So sometimes it's a requirement and sometimes it just helps. Right? So that's also can be a motivation for doing uh, co-production on your film. So here comes some of the negatives. And this is important also. I'm, I don't, like I said, most of the films I've done are co-production. So uh, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to open your eyes to, so you can be realistic about it. Money costs. If you're lacking 200,000 on your, f in your financing plan, <coughs> you're not, no lo and you decide that you're gonna go for co-production, you're no longer looking for 200,000, you're probably looking for 275,000 or 300,000. Money costs. Uh, there are co-producers fees and overheads, there's travel and accommodation, translations, extra deliveries, all of this. So your budget is not the same when you decide to take a national production and make it international. So that's very important. It takes time, there's a lot of time going into uh, building a co-production. There's extra administration. If you have many partners, you have much more uh, things that you have to deliver, you have to deliver cost reports, you have to keep up. It's so um, there's a share of creative control. You are not the only person to make decisions. There's a loss of flexibility. That is something that I always, there are some added requirements. I always urge you to be aware of that and don't compromise beyond reason. Because in the end, it, nobody will ever thank you for having made a beautiful co-production structure. It's all about the film in the end. So if there is a cost to the film, it has to be minimal. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a minute. And then there's, of course, the shares of rights and revenues. But then, presumably, you have a bit of bigger film with better production value, all of that. And, and one of the dangers can be a shift in the producer's focus. If you have a very compli complicated co-production structure, I, I, I've experienced that myself, and I don't have the solution. 
uh, I only have the frustration that because I like to be very close to my filmmakers, um, especially in development and in post-production, and <coughs> you tend to be more uh, busy during um, production. So that makes it tolerable, but if you have a very complicated co-production structure, the producer can become uh, very tied up in in managing the co-production rather than being close. So if you are the kind of a creative producer who wants to be close to the filmmaker, uh, you may want to build strategies for, for that. Maybe have a very, very good line producer or a very good controller or something like that. That's not always possible on documentaries because after all the budgets are limited. That's why it's a frustration for me sometimes. But uh, but it's, it's necessary to understand that you can lose that close connection, creative connection, uh, if you don't have, if you haven't thought about it. One thing I wanted to say, now I've listed the negatives, but one of the things that I wanted to say also as a positive, uh, which I really strongly believe in, is that there, there is a tendency that on a national level, it's very easy as a producer to become professionally lonely. Uh, the in film industry is <coughs> consists of a lot of small companies with very few people who think that all the others are competitors in their own country. They don't talk a lot. Uh, they, they sort of sit in their little office and have to solve very big problems. And it's a hugely complicated mm. area. We have so many things that we're supposed to know something about, right? We have to know how to work with talent, with writers, with stories. We have to know how to finance. We have to understand some legal things. We have to understand union rules, all of that. It's sometimes easier to build that uh, sort of uh, easygoing working relationship with a co-producer on a creative level or, you know, let's, let's talk about how we solve this because there is no competition. I mean, I, in Denmark we have actually very good working relationship between the producers, especially in the documentary field. We work together a lot, we always call each other for advice, we have a little group, we meet frequently to discuss this and the other. So we, do, we have created a non-competitive uh, environment even though we are competitors. But it's very still very easy to become professionally lonely because you're busy, you, everybody's overworked and underfinanced and you don't have time to go and meet. And, but if you have a co-producer, you have that person with you all the time that you can discuss with. And, and, and if you're then smart enough to choose a co-producer that brings something that you are not, that are, you do not bring or, you, you know, who knows something that you don't know as well or, you know, then so that you complement each other instead of bringing exactly the same. Uh, then, then you already have a much stronger footing in a way in the in the production. So it it's it can be really helpful. Let's move on quickly to uh, how co-production. So first, just really quickly, just to and I'm sure you already know this. I just want to go through the sources of finance real quickly. Or maybe I won't even spend time on it because it's just a slide you can go back to look at it and of course when you build a strategy you have all these different pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that you can play with and just to give you a quick example uh, when you're for instance setting up a co-production uh, for a documentary if you are co-producing with countries that require creative input you have don't have a whole lot because the crews are often very small because otherwise you're disturbing the environment that you are trying to film without disturbing it. So you have maybe the director is even also the DOP. Maybe he's also the DOP and the sound recordist. So you have very small crews. So you, you uh, exhaust your possibility of giving creative, creative key roles to other co-producing countries very quickly. They're gone. So then you have to look into other types of money that does not require that. And that could be tax, for instance. It could be uh, other things. But, but it's just to, to, this slide is also to make you aware that you can build a co-production strategy looking at different types of money with different requirements added to them. Not just, money is not just money. Money comes with different strings attached and with different requirements and with different 
opportunities. So it's just to look at the sources and think, if I do this, then what? And maybe I can combine this with that. The typical requirements from national and regional funds are creative input, local spend, and quite often, not always, it could be, for instance, that you have to spend 150% of what you get in a region. I want to talk about that for one second, because when you're looking at your finance plan, if you have three of those, you run out of money very quickly. You can get uh, in a panic quite quickly. Uh, the thing is that, first of all, of course, like a pre-sale, for instance, to the national, to, to, that, the, to the TV in that territory, will make up for that, for instance. But not in small countries, because the pre-sales are tiny, right? So you need some money to cover these types of re requirements that, that you spent 150%. It can also be, for instance, the Creative Europe money, or it can be Euromarsh that, that help that. So that's where the, the pan-national funding uh, comes in really well. It can also be industry money. You know, it can be, um, for instance, sometimes, just to give you an example, if you have, um, you can, if you have a facility provider, let's say post-production facility provider, you can sometimes ne negotiate a deal and make the budget smaller. You can also sometimes mm. negotiate a deal that, uh, where they don't give you a discount, but they invest what would have been the discount. So, you know, there are, thing, there are ways of making this, and there's also ways of putting, adding other money, I'll get back into that in a minute, to a territory. So. And I want to just mention one thing that I'm not going to go into, because it's too complicated for now. I just want you to have heard it, the term double dipping. There's a term called double dipping, and this is where it gets really complicated. And if you are out doing your first uh, co-production, don't attempt to do it yourself. Get advice. Double dipping means that some cost can count in two territories. You don't get to account them twice because that would raise the budget, but you can give hand in account. And it sounds illegal. It's not. It's the way it's done. So. One cost can, can count as a local spend in Germany and in Belgium, for instance. So that sometimes the 50% that you have to spend more in that country, it is less money because the counts in two places. So I just want you to know it's out there. We're not going to spend time on it now. But it's because, let's say, I'm not, I'm not even sure, to be honest, that this is a, a, a valid example. But just for the sake of argument, if you have if you're shooting in Germany and your DOP is Belgium, I think that part of that cost can count both in Belgium and in Germany. So it's just, it's this kind, the double dipping means that the same cost will go into the local, the, the, the local uh, spend accounts, but not of course in the global, in your final account, it's only there once of course, but it counts twice. All right, let's move on. Reciprocity is sometimes a thing. Local distribution very often required that you have secured distribution that, that because the most, most of the funding bodies are taxpayer, taxpayer funded, <coughs> which means that they want to know that their taxpayers get the chance to see the film. So this is very often the case. Um, and then recoupment is also a, a requirement. So to come back to what I said before, the way you approach how co-production is really to look at, of course, what you need, but then immediately after that, you look at what do I have to offer? Why would it be, this be interesting for the UK or for Denmark or for Norway? What is it that I have here that makes it likely that they would fund me? So instead of what do I need, the, the really the really crucial part of building a co-production structure is what do I have to offer? Why would they do it? Not because you want it. So things that go into that could be part in an attractive project, of course. That's sort of the key. 
right? That's the first point. Um, but it's not enough. And then there are the Cree K2 positions, and like I said, it's really can be a challenge on documentaries. There's credit, track record, experience. It can be, for instance, not uh, there's the obvious if you have a star or somebody that's really hot. But it can also be, for instance, uh, in, in my instance, for instance, when I'd already been a producer for 20 years, I um, had a co-production with Finland and I chose a very young co-producer. And for Finland, that was interesting that they are very young rising producer would then be working with somebody who had a lot more experience and had had done co-production or so that can be a selling point too you know it, it's it's not as it's it's about not looking only at the obvious things but also at uh, at things that you can tell them so this I, I i love to share my knowledge with the up and coming you know whatever it is it can be the awards, like I said before, uh, revenues that is likely to make money, of course. It can be turnover, and, and I mean turnover not just in terms of the producer, it can also be turnover for the region, it can be, you know, uh, you know that you will involve a lot. Let's say you have a very, uh, a lot of uh, special effects, for instance, that is, can be interesting for a film institute or a regional fund because that's a lot of money in one place and a long time that people will be staying in the region, for instance. It can be the strategic partnerships, um, reciprocity. It doesn't have to be like, because the, the truth is, for instance, I cannot offer reciprocity per se because I'm not in charge of whether the film institute says yes or no to co-produce, to, to fund the co-production. I can say that I will work for it, but I can't promise it per se. So, so this is something that can become complicated, but sometimes you can offer other things as reciprocity. Yes, I will work for pre-sales in Scandinavia because I know all the TV stations or, you know, something, even if we don't get funded by the Film Institute, I will do this and that for you, or I offer to do this and that for you. What, when you're thinking about what you have to offer, sometimes you can have content that is especially suited for different types of finance. And this, is, this can be true for a lot of things. I mean, if there is a, let's find a good example if I can, is a film called 1989 that was uh, to be ready for the 25th anniversary of the fall of the wall. You all immediately know that every television station in the world, no, well, in Europe, is going to air something on that date. If you come early enough and say, we're gonna have this film, it has a new take on it, you have something to offer because they are looking for that. They don't know yet. It can be that. It can be all other things. It can be a, a, a theme that's uh, coming up in a country or an election, or if you have something that's relevant, let them know because they won't know when your film will be finished much closer to the event and they will already make their plans. And so you have to sell in advance. And it can also be, of course, for uh, NGOs, uh, other kinds of partners, partners that can be both part financing partners, but they can also be outreach partners, part of the distribution. And if you have a really interesting outreach uh, structure built up already, meaning how the film gets out, not just through the traditional systems, but in other ways, ways of enhancing uh, awareness of it, debates, all these kind of things. And that can be both for fiction and documentary. That is also interesting for a film institute, for instance, knowing that it will be very much in the public sphere. And there will be a lot of talk of it, a lot of extra coverage, not just a review of the film, but actually a lot of uh, context around it. That's also interesting. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the deals, but I am going to give you these uh, bullet points here. These are the most important things to talk about, even if you're just doing a deal memo. Uh, these things should be covered. For instance, I can only raise production, co-production funding in Denmark for minority co-production if I have some kind of creative role. So it's 
absolutely crucial to me that you promise me a really interesting role. So if you promise me the editor, for instance, and then you come back later and said, well, by the way, you can have a production assistant. That's not going to make it for me. So that makes it impossible for me to be the, the co-producer. So it's, imp it's important that you already at the start of the uh, cooperation between you find out what are the requirements, what, are, what is flexible, what is not flexible. Of course we can change the editor maybe to the composer or the sound designer or something if it's very important. It's not that we can't change anything, but it has to be on a level where it's still possible for me to meet my national requirements. It's very important to, to discuss who does what and who gets what in terms of the actual both practical and financial thing. And then of course the budget, uh, including contingency and overheads. And if I can make a point about contingencies, because for me, and this is something I do uh, struggle with every time I make a co-production, but I, I think it's worth struggling over, so I do it. It's very often the case that if you say, hey, for instance, in, in Danish documentary, there's a rule, you have a 10% contingency. And if you have a three-way co-production, it's natural that you put 10% uh, on each of the budgets, whatever the budget is, 10% of that will go in the contingency. I happen to think that that's a mistake because very often uh, the overcosts are not spread evenly, right? You need them for perhaps for longer editing, especially in documentary, it's hard to know how long you're going to be editing. And then if there is 10% uh, overcost in the shooting budget in Norway, it's very likely that the money will be gone because it's there and why shouldn't they spend it when if it's in their budget. So I always try to say that, for instance, 3% is automatically allocated to whatever uh, national budget there is, but the seven other percent is actually mine to decide where to spend, or it's a negotiation, or we have to agree on it. Because I don't want all of the money to be gone by the time I need them. In, in reality, there will only be a very small percentage of contingency left for post-production, for instance, if you share it like that. But it's, it's not the way it's normally done. And it's something you have to fight for, so that's why I'm putting... I, I, I mean, I've done it a million times, and I have to fight every time with the Film Institute. Uh, that looks weird, and say yes, but it's good. Trust me. <laughs> so, then I also want you to be aware that a financing <coughs> territory and a distribution territory is not necessarily the same. If you are in a project together, to, and you're going to try to finance it, raising money in other territories. If you're a co-producer, let's say you're the main producer, and you realize that you need money from Germany. If you have not worked with Germany before, and your co-producer has done five co-productions with Germany, you might want to say that your co-producer is responsible for raising money in Germany. So they have that as a financing territory. Or you may work with a small country, and they need um, um, well, let's say Denmark, small country, right? And you need to raise quite a lot of money, but you know that you probably need more than, than uh, I can raise in Denmark. Then you might allocate the rest of Scandinavia to me, saying, and you can also go and make pre-sales in Norway and Sweden. So you, as a financing territory, you have more than your own. This doesn't mean I own the territories forever. The one, once the film is financed, you can still say that distribution-wise, it's just your own territory, and, and whatever you've done, you've been rewarded for in some kind of way, and it still belongs to rest. Whatever extra revenues comes from this territory is considered rest of the world revenues. So I just want to mention that distribution territory and financing territory is not necessarily the same. One very, very important point that I swear to God that all new co-producers forget it's to put some kind of timeline into the first deal memo. When are your co-producers supposed to have raised the money out of their territory? Because if there's not a timeline and you work, let's say you work with Italy where they just decide to, to uh, postpone the, uh, the decision-making half a year and then another half a year or you know, 
you can end up, you can have all the other financing in place and you can end up waiting forever and maybe lose financing in some countries while you wait. So there has to be a timeline in the contract saying that by this date they have to have raised the finance or you are allowed to say sorry, we have to move on. Okay, yeah. Quick question. Yes. Um, in terms of the deal memo, like, um, how important do you think it is to have a deal memo before you start actually looking into uh, working with somebody? So, so I, I need to know if you're talking to the trainer or the producer. The trainer will say, yes, have the deal memo in place. The producer will say, hmm, it quite often comes a little bit later. Yeah. But what I, ha what I would advise is that, especially if you are friends, I would advise that you share what the deal memo would look, would look like very early on. This is kind of what I'm looking at. Because mm -hmm. especially with friends, there, there is a tendency we don't want to talk about money. But when we then get to talking about the money, we can really get surprised and annoyed and maybe not be friends anymore and all of that. It's much easier to put it on the table saying, this is the kind of principles I, I'm looking at. This is how I see it. Um, can we talk about this? And then we'll, we'll just take a few more steps and see if it's viable to continue. But if we actually do co-produce together, this is the kind of deal that we will look at. I think that's easier and, and uh, better. I, I don't know why we think it's so... Um, a, a lot of creative people, and I think a lot of producers uh, look at themselves as creative people. I certainly do. Uh, they don't like talking about money. It's like the money is, you know, dirty. It's the film, it's the art, it's the... Uh, and, and, you know, the, the unwillingness to talk about money can create such a lot of dirt, mess, uh, things like that. So to put it on the table before you even start talking, then it's very simple. You know, it's like, you know, this is my standard template, contract, uh, these are the principles I normally work with. If we go forward together, is there a, do you have an issue with this? Or, you know, we can talk details later. But it can be simple things like, do you have um, allocated territories or do you share all the revenues, for instance? Principles like that can be very important to think about. Because... What is typical there? I mean, that, that's not... Traditionally, a um, co-producing country would take their territory, wouldn't they? Yes. But then that kind of changed and they shared the world, didn't they? Yeah, I think that there are there are really pros and cons. Uh, if, you ha if your co-producers retain their own territory, they tend to work harder for the distribution in that territory. That's a pro for having them have their territory. If you have pan-national funding where you have to pay back from all the... It's much more difficult because you don't really control the revenues from that territory. And from a more sort of a more emotional point of view, for instance, um, I made the, the one of the my first co-production, the one I did before the wall wall came down. I, I was complete novice. I didn't know what I was doing. It was all learning by doing, and I ended up out of my ignorance sharing. So I had Scandinavia. It was a Polish language film. I had Scandinavia. Uh, Poland had Poland and all the Eastern Bloc countries, and France had France and all the French-speaking territories. If you start counting per capita, I mean, right? I mean, I had like 15 million people, and you know, France and all the French-speaking territories, Poland and all the East of Europe, I mean, they had so much more. And a Polish film is much more interesting in Poland and the Eastern country, and in France, who has a tradition for watching Polish cinema, than in Scandinavia. So I mean, it's a completely stupid divide. And the, one of the things that become complicated with sharing territories is that exactly that. There's how many people are we talking about? What is the cinema industry? How likely is it the film will be actually be a success? As it so it becomes very difficult to put a value on a territory. And in a way, if you've done, if you really truly did something together, do you want one co producer to go bankrupt and the other to be rich? I mean, so so it's it's also that, and uh, so are, are, are even strategies kind of 
kind of still pursue today? Or yeah. are yes. There are, as many as and a deal memo is not a long form contract. You no. can always have a deal memo signed with the steps, and that doesn't mean that you're binded to create the long form contract if things don't No, no, it, I will, there should be, you yeah, know, like a one page yes, deal memo. Yes, absolutely, or one and, and a half something or something. That you sign because yeah. it's the, it's, it's the, the point yeah, but I, I think the point is that the actual signature the actual form, is. Can sometimes be a re premature that you feel that it's premature. I understand that mm. you want to, but I think it's a good idea to have put it on the table. I mean, I, I think that there are pros and cons. I really do think that, and uh, I, I do both. I tend to share revenues rather than territories. But on the film I'm doing right now, for instance, uh, we sh we have we own each other's, I mean, our own territories, and then we share the rest. So it's not, you can't say that it's uh, one way or the other, but it's, it's also because that the, the distribution that we force each, each of the three co-producers had in mind for their own territory, we're so not comparable, uh, both in how it was meant to be done and what the, in the level of work was, that we just felt that it became difficult to also control the stream of money through them. So, so we just decided to do that. So we share the rest of the world, is sharing revenues from the rest of the world, but not from the uh, national territory. So just to say, because the share of revenues, this is, what, this is also what we are talking about right now. So the share of revenue and the ownership, that's based on a number of things. It's, it's co-production rules and conventions that they, prescribe a certain way of looking at it but you can you can have exceptions to the rules if there's a good reason to it I just want to to say that and uh, then of course it's also down to negotiation you can agree on something which is not set in stone from the beginning or anything else and <coughs> The one of the principles that we just talked about, are you sharing money, are you sharing territories? That's, that's a basic principle. How, how is it set up, the deal? Mm -hmm. And if you have exclusive territories, you have to have some kind of evaluation of the value of a territory or, or the projected value of a territory. It can be very difficult to know. Uh, you can perhaps get a sales agent to help you. Uh, get a value on the territory so that you have an idea of what is the worth of this territory, so that you don't just say, well, you have France and I have Denmark, and, and they, I mean, they're not non-comparable. Right? So you, you have to have that in mind when you do the when negotiation. I, if, you, if you are very new to co-production and you have a very experienced co-producer from a big country, they are going to pretend that uh, you always share according to the financing only. That if they bring 100,000 and the budget is 200,000, they own 50% of the revenues. This is going to be the first that they bring up. I am coming from a small country, having done a lot of co-production with uh, low-cost <coughs> countries. I don't think that's the way to do it necessarily. I think you have to look at other things. And this is why I'm bringing this up, because um, you have a lot of room for looking at it differently. Um, there's also the value of the money. There's different types of money. If, you, if somebody deferred their entire salary, should they have, should they have a, a position in the recruitment before people who've been paid 100%, for instance? I think that's very, uh, a fair way to look at it, just to mention one thing. But there is a, there is a tendency that cool cash is always looked at as the most important, so that cool cash comes in quite early. It's also a way to look at it, does cool cash come in before soft money, for instance? Do you mean by cool cash? Cool, in, I mean investment, real, real money, um. right? If, if it's, if it's uh, subsidies, soft loans, grants, whatever, there's very often um, it's not as painful. If, I mean, people don't expect all of it to come back, for instance. In Denmark, in documentary, we don't pay back. The subsidy is a grant. We don't pay back. So 
uh, of course, it doesn't necessarily make sense that I get revenues for in the entire part of the money that is coming out of my fund if I work with a, if I co-produce with somebody who has invested their entire salary, for instance. That's not fair. Right? So, so there is a fairness principle that is not put down in any kind of rules and regulations that you have to apply to it. I give you an example. I was approached to do a UK co-production, and um, and I really liked the film, but the the UK producer had already decided on a set of rules that were not really interesting for me because they wanted everybody to have exactly the same kind of uh, producer's uh, fee, and that was based on the pre-sale that you could make in your country and the other co-producer was German. So Germany makes one pre-sale and uh, raises 100,000 euros, and the German co-producer get 10% of 100,000 euros. That's a good fee. I raise 6,000 euros, and it's the same amount of work, and I get <laughs> 600 euros for my work. So, I mean, that principle didn't work for me. So I, I, in the end, I said, no, no, thank you. And so, uh, but just, it's just an example. Then there's like what we said before, the value of the input, not just the cost. If somebody has done the entire film and you do only the sound post-production, you, you are not 50-50 partners. You should not be 50-50 partners, no matter what the financing is, in my point of view. There's also things like responsibility, experience, initiation, who initiated the project, who developed it, who, uh, who has been with it for the longest. Things like that also can pay into it and the workload. And then there's the good financial principle of risk and reward. If you have put in a lot of money very early where it's very risky and you don't know if there's going to be a film, and your co-producer comes on board when you know there's going to be a film, and there's very little risk involved because it's funded, that also makes a difference. So, some solutions to percentage rules and the issue of high and low cost countries. I'm going to talk about one of the cases now, like a real case example. Uh, the 1989 film for the anniversary of the fall of the wall was a natural co-production between Denmark, Germany and Hungary because uh, it was a Danish director, uh, it was a Danish main producer, me, and it was a story set in Germany and in Hungary and there were uh, um, partners from both countries. In Hungary, we, were, we had URMR support, so we had to have the 10% in Hungary. But Hungary, they kept postponing the decision from the film fund, so, and we had to shoot in a summer because otherwise we wouldn't be finished for the anniversary. There was no way we could postpone it. So we had to go ahead and shoot, which meant we didn't get the money from the fund, so we, still, we only had the tax credit money in Hungary. But we still had to keep the 10% of financing coming out of Hungary because otherwise we would lose Euromash because that was a rule at that time. So one of the ways, and we did do, the truth was we did uh, maybe 80% of the entire shoot of the film was in Hungary. So it was a real co-production. And my point here is that if it's a real co-production, if you're not trying to cheat the system, you can always talk to people about ways to solve it. You can talk to UMRs about it, for instance, say, I have this problem. And they will accept uh, uh, reasonable solutions to it. So one of the things we did to bring the financing in, in uh, Hungary up to the 10% was that I had made some pre-sales in non co-producer territories. I made a pre-sale to the Netherlands, I had made a pre-sale to Finland, I had made something else and I had made a deal, a, a kind of a facility deal with another country. All of those deals were then allocated to the Hungarian co-producers. So you make an attachment or an annex to your co-production deal and we're saying, by the way, the Hungarian co-producer has the right to pre-sale in, pre in the territory of Finland and the Netherlands and, and then suddenly it becomes Hungarian money legally and you solve the problem. So that's one way of solving the percentage rules. So it doesn't have, have an expectation of ownership or, or reward? It, it can have. 
in, in this case, in this particular case, I, you can, you can for co of course, then negotiate that you share revenues in a different way. But again, it's a financing territory, it's not a revenue. So it's just the value of the sale and you need the money anyway. So it's not a big thing. And for me, I was fine with having the Hungarian co-producers stay at 10% uh, ownership and revenue of the film because they really did a big part of the work. They did 80% of the shoot, even though they couldn't raise the money. So for me, that was fine. I didn't change anything. So I don't, I don't have an issue with that. I, I think it's, it's fine. And, and it really was that their system that failed them, right? Because they kept postponing the, the decision-making date beyond the time where we had to shoot. So to uh, another way of solving, this is not now, this was about how to solve the percentage rules in the actual co-production structure. When we talk about solving some of the issues of fairness and other things that we just talked about, you can have, for instance, exclusive or shared territories. You can allocate, you can decide that Hungary, if I had wanted to, I could decide that Hungary to get more, if I hadn't given them up to the 10%, I could decide that they would own uh, the rest of the Balkans is distribution territories. Maybe it wouldn't have been worth any kind of money for them, but at least it would be a show, show a sign of my understanding that they needed something. They, you can have that, you can do that, you can decide that in a deal. You have to argue why, they will ask you, why is that? But as long as it's from a fairness principle and a reality principle, something based in reality, it's a real co-production, they did this for the film, you are likely to to make it happen, to be able to make it happen. And then you can have corridors, and by corridors in the revenue, it means that you can decide that out of the 100% of the revenue coming in, let's say you have a deal where everybody just shares revenue, there are no exclusive territories. You can decide that out of that 100%, 5% goes first to the initiating, 5% uh, of the 100% always go to the initiating producer because they've had taken all the risk, they've done all the work, so they should have more than the others. That's a corridor. Your mass also has a corridor. And then you look at the rest of the, then you, the 95% become the new 100% that you then share according to the financing. That's one way. So you can play with time and you can pay, play with corridors, you can play with territories. There are you can also say that the first 100,000, if somebody has worked for free, you can say that the first 100,000 or 13,000 goes directly to those who defer it. Yes? Will um, national funding agencies support that kind of structure? Uh, I mean, I can't speak for all of them. That would be... Because normally they have rules, don't they? They, they, they have rules, but quite often, if you, can, if you have a solid argument, this is why this makes sense because we are trying to balance off a low cost or a high cost country, for instance. You can, most of the time, I don't, I don't, I can't recall ever not having been able to make the argument and get, I'm, I've sometimes had to fight for it, but I, I can't recall not getting through with an argument like this. I once had to put it off differently. For instance, what I talked about before with the contingency, I, they, they, they forced me to keep it in the, the different national budgets, the 10%, and then I had to write in my co-production uh, contract that they were only allowed to spend 3% of the 10% and then, you know, so normally you can, you know, find, find a compromise that works for you and for the rules, let's say it like that, because a lot of the times the, the people um, in the fun, funds or other institutions with regulation, they want to just uh, make it look as if they is, is it okay talk to, to the rules. that argument or that fight later on in the day? Like you could have a deal memo between a party and it, it's kind of straightforward and it might be premature to argue those points at that point. Is it okay to... To argue later, later, yes. When things are more solid and tangible? Yes, of course, because this is, for instance, the, uh, the, the case I just gave you with Hungary, that happened along the way, right? It was, there was one agreement and then reality didn't turn out the way we had hoped and then we had to. Uh, so I think there are, in that, I, we probably have like 
two or three annexes to the contract where we had to add another territory or add another deal to them to make the percentages work. So, so that was, uh, yeah. yeah, you can do it along the way. That's life. You can change, I mean, as long as everybody agrees, you can change a contract all the time until the end of time, basically. If you agree, you can add something to it or you can uh, revise it or, and, and very often what you set out with in terms of finance, for instance, is a projected, projected financing plan, projected percentages, and the reality will have you revise it later. Just one last work about the remuneration of outreach work. This is especially true for documentaries, that if the main producer has, does a lot of outreach, that has to be somehow mm -hmm. accounted for in this, how you split revenues, because that has a lot to do with how many revenues you make. So, and it's, n it's very often not part of the production budget, and therefore not part of the co-production agreement up front. So this is just something to, to think about. Okay, last slide. Rules of thumb. So, now I've said a lot about technicalities, strategies, all of that. But what I really want you to not ever forget is that as the main producer, your absolute main goal and focus should be to protect the project. So, it's so easy to get caught up in the strategy and the, oh, and I can do this, and I, they have, they have tax incentives here, and I can do this, and I can do that. It becomes a game. But if it doesn't make sense for the film, it doesn't make sense. You have to find another solution. And, and this m has also to do with protecting the creative space. Uh, and what the effect is on screen. I'll give you two examples. One of the Centropa films, uh, I, d I don't know if it was Europa or, uh, I think it was, but in one of them was a French co-production. And in Fran France, they have this quota system where they had, you had to have so and so many actors that was from France. They ended up flying extras from France to Denmark to meet the quota system. That makes absolutely no sense, right? Because the cost of doing that does not end up on screen, and it just makes everything complicated. So you have to think about these things. Does it make sense? There's also, for instance, I've seen during the Arbor, for instance, I've seen a lot of initial co-production structures where you, you want to do uh, shoot a children's film in Germany, for you come from Norway and you want to shoot a children's film in Germany, that has such an enormous impact on the children. They are away from their home, they are away from their parents, parents have to take two months off work to go with them to live in Germany, things like that. It does, it, it is almost bound to have a negative effect on what's on screen, so don't go there. I mean, you really have to think about, is this okay? If you have a deputy director, do you want him to have a crew where nobody speaks his language, for instance? Or, you know, you, you have to think about building up the creative core of the film through the way you structure the co-production. It's not just about where can I get the money. It's also about where can I make sure that this gets to be the best film possible, because that was the initial, that was the initial motive. Don't ever forget it. Put it up on the wall. So you see it every day and move it so that you don't get so used to it that you don't read it. So move it around every week, something like that. So, and you have to make sure that you maintain quality, not just in the result, not just in the film, but also in the work process, because quality in the work process ends up on screen. So don't overcomplicate it. Use common sense. Is this a good idea? Will I rather have less money uh, and do it in an another way? Will I rather cut this big scene where I have 10,000 extras and then uh, make sure that we can work in a way that I feel comfortable with? So really, really protect the project. Uh, find good partners. Somebody who can deliver. It's if you find if you meet somebody at, and they've never done a co-production before and you've never done a co-production before, you might feel very comfortable talking to each other. But will they deliver? Can they get you the money uh, or the distribution? It has to be somebody that you trust and who you would like to spend a year, two years, three years working with. That's very important. 
but it also has to be somebody who compliments you. We, we tend to choose somebody who's just like us. It's not the best idea in co-production. You want to choose somebody who you really like, but who's not just like you. It's like, it should be like a, a love interest, right? At opposites attract. Somebody who is feel very comfortable going to cocktail parties like I don't, for instance, and you know, say, hey, you want to meet me? Things like that. You can, you can really find something more important than that, but it was a bad example, but still, uh, you know, find somebody who has, I mean, if, if I have, let's say, animation element of my film, and I know very little about animation, you want to find a co-producer who has that experience. Better example. Um, Somebody who needs the things that you have to offer and offer the things that you need. That's the perfect match. And of course, they have to show both interest and commitment. It has to be somebody that you, you can sometimes convince people if you're a smooth talker, but they have to also be convinced five minutes after you've gone. They, want, they have to want to do it. So you, you have to evaluate that. And somebody who has stable structures and companies. And you might want to actually do a little bit of research into whether their companies are stable. Because having a bankruptcy in the middle of a co-production, trust me, I've tried it. It's not funny. It's not a good idea. Um, actually, I, my, my one of, I think my second big co-production, there were two bankruptcies on the same production. I mean, it was like, I always thought, and if I survived that, I'm, I'm probably immortal. It was the worst possible <laughs> co-production ever. But uh, the film was okay, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs>